Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can everybody hear us? I think they may be loading in still. Yeah, still joining. I just check. Uh, yep. So if if anyone's managed to join, um, if you can hear us okay and see us okay, if you um want to drop a message in the chat, um, just so we know that everything's looking okay. We'll probably wait one or two minutes um, just to get everyone into the Demio event and then we'll um, probably kick off at just a few minutes past 11. All right, cool. All right, thanks see everybody. You. Yeah, I can see a lot of thumbs. I can see lots of all goods, so that's good. Um, I hope everyone is having fun and staying safe wherever you are around the country at the moment. I know that it's uh, been a interesting time uh, just recently. So um, it's good that we can still do all these online events and, you know, share some information around, give everyone something to help fill in their day. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Haggart, for the uh, for the heart react. <laughs> All right, I think yeah, got a couple more people that look like they're coming in. Um, but I think we'll more or less start at probably four or five minutes past eleven, just to um make sure we keep the train rolling, so that we don't keep everybody waiting. We've got the all good from Bruno, so that's good. <laughs> but I think, yep, everyone's coming in. I think I'll probably um, kick it off. What do you reckon, Jim? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, we'll keep, uh, if, if, if people keep joining in, they'll, um, Obviously, they'll have to play catch up, but that's fine. So um, can everybody see the presentation slides just before I start? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. So uh, just a little, just some housekeeping. Um, we'll keep our webinars on for the start, our cameras on, sorry, for the start of the webinar, um, but we'll probably remove them a little bit later just so the slides get a bit bigger um, so that everyone can see the presentation. And uh, also on top of that, if you still want to enlarge the presentation anymore, um, you can obviously pop out the chat bubble into its own window and that should make the slides even bigger for you. Um, but with all that being said, uh, welcome everybody to Think Brick Australia's first episode of our new architectural webinar series. Um, so today we're going to cover the introduction to masonry design um, and go through some of the you know, rudimentary design aspects of masonry architecture, um, followed by going through uh, an exciting case study to give you a little bit more inspiration um, and ideas about uh, the many ways that masonry can be used. So firstly, I just want to go through a little bit about who we are as Think Brick Australia. Um, so we here, we're the peak body representing Australia's clay brick and paper manufacturers. Um, so essentially what we want to do is we want to make it easier to build in bricks, blocks and pavers. Um, we do that through a couple of different things. You know, we facilitate important conversations in the industry. Um, we support and promote our members' products um, as well as developing talent uh, both on an engineering as well as a design perspective within the industry. Um, so this flows into our key strategy um, as an industry association. So 
We, uh, we undertake research uh, with universities such as University of Newcastle, South Australia, QUT. Um, we look for engagement opportunities with engineers, designers, um, looking at uh, facilitating with Standards Australia to ensure that our members' products are used as, as consistently in the construction industry. Um, and then what's more well known amongst the audience here, I would imagine, are our Think Brick Awards. Um, so these awards uh, celebrate innovative architectural design and construction within the masonry industry. I um, mean, there's numerous categories within this awards for both bricks, uh, as well as concrete blocks, uh, roof tiles, landscaping design, uh, both on a commercial and a residential scale. Um, so with that in mind, I would just like to remind everybody uh, here today that we're currently announcing our top 40 project finalists for this year's Think Brick Awards on our Think Brick Instagram. Um, so I thoroughly recommend having a look at our Instagram and seeing some of the exciting projects um, that are using bricks in some crazy, fun and exciting ways. So definitely do go check that out um, because we will be announcing our winners in mid-August. Um, so just a little bit more on this, we also have our Think Brick podcast. Um, if any of you have checked that out, we have uh, tech talks where we talk about some engineering perspectives of masonry design. Um, but more exciting, we actually interview some famous well-known architects from around the country. Um, so previous guests include Amy Muir, Neil Durbach, Rachel Neeson, Adrian Spence, um, and we've got some more exciting guests uh, continuing to come onto the podcast in the future. Uh, and it's definitely a great place to have a bit of a listen to, you know, if you're out walking or exercising, um, you know, that's the only opportunity to get out of the house at the moment. So if you're ever doing that, I would thoroughly recommend having a bit of a listen and, you know, seeing what some of these well-known architects have to say about design um, and architecture and some of their inspirations. So, you know, what can you get out of Think Brick Australia? Um, how can we help you? So we also have free resources available. So these are gonna include our technical manuals, research papers um, and case studies, which sort of go through some examples of successful and innovative masonry design. Um, but as well as that, we are here as a technical resource. So we have a team dedicated here at Think Brick to answering any of your technical inquiries that you might have. Uh, so if you ever have a project where you're not sure or you're wanting a little bit of design advice as to how to achieve something uh, from an engineering perspective, um, that's what we're here for. And we're here to have a bit of a look at some of these past designs um, and past Australian standards to you know, help you make the designs that you set out to design. Um, and just quickly, you know, obviously Think Brick, uh, we're here to support our members. So we have members on national, state and regional levels. Um, so big shout out to all of these guys, PGH, Austral, Brickmakers, Midland, um, all the way down to some of our smaller members, Krauss, Natural Brick Co. Um, you know, these are the people, these are the companies that we're actively trying to support um, and get their products used in these really exciting and creative manners. So just a little bit about myself and Jim here next to me as well. Our role at Think Brick, we are a part of the technical team. So we're both graduate engineers. Um, and our role is to you know, develop technical documents, uh, research and review current technical papers and use all of this research and information to essentially help you, architects, building designers and engineers, uh, use masonry in the ways that you would like to, in the you know, creative, zany, downright wacky, um, exciting projects. So what should you get out of this series? Um, firstly, a better understanding of the types of masonry units uh, you might wanna use in your projects. You know, it's not just going to be your standard brick that exists anymore. Um, and a wider knowledge of masonry applications. So a little bit about learning how to use bricks for curved walls, stack bonding, arches, um, and the many ways that projects have come together with these architectural techniques. And this flows into our case studies that we will be covering throughout this series. So today we're gonna to do a bit of an introduction to masonry design, but in future episodes, we're going to be focusing on previous successful projects um, and going into a little bit more detail about how the architects, engineers, builders, bricklayers, 
actually made the project come together. And more, most importantly, we're here for technical assistance and guide us, guidance. Um, so if you have any questions today with anything that we go through or in the future with any of your projects, definitely feel free to reach out to us um, either through website or email uh, or any of our socials channels as well, because at the end of the day, uh, we want to help you make the buildings that you want to design. So do feel free to reach out to us. So uh, the contents for today, we're going to go through, Jim's going to take us through uh, an introduction into masonry units and walling systems that we can apply with masonry units. Um, then I'm going to take us through some of the benefits of masonry design, as well as some of the architectural masonry techniques uh, that can be used and applied with bricks. And then finally, Jim is going to take you through a case study um, and we will reveal that building at the end uh, when we reach it, but it's definitely worth sticking around for because it's pretty interesting and downright crazy and insane to think about a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think Jim is going to turn on spotlight mode, which should hide our face cams. Yeah. Um, um, before we start, um, I want to do a quick poll um, just to see uh, how many of you guys are familiar with who we are and if you guys have heard of the Think Brick Awards before that Jack mentioned earlier. So there should be a poll coming up. Yes or no, have you previously entered the awards or if you've even heard of the awards? Um, just to gauge um, how much you know about us and, <laughs> and how much there is to learn. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. There you go. It's a bit of a bit of a mixed split there, so it's interesting. Good to see a lot of people have heard of the awards or entered the awards. Yeah, I think a, a lot of architects in here for sure. Yeah, it's great to see. Definitely. Um, so I might palm off to you, Jim, then. And okay. if you want to if you want to drive, you can um, take it moving forward. All right. Thanks, Jack. All right. So um, thanks for that, Paul, guys. Firstly, um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown into what is actually masonry, right? So introduction to masonry, what is masonry? Masonry, more or less, is essentially any bunch of individual units bounded together or glued together by mortar, right? So these units could be, you know, uh, concrete blocks, they could be stone units, or they could be clay bricks. Um, as long as they're bounded together or glued together by that mortar, we would consider that masonry. When designing masonry structures in Australia, um, there are a few building codes that we like to look at. The first one being the National Construction Code, obviously. And that's kind of the legislative uh, document that outlines some of the minimum requirements when we're building. When we're looking deeper into masonry and concrete bricks, that's right, Michael. Um, when we're looking deeper into masonry, um, we might also look at the Australian standards. And AS 3700 is a real, really great standard um, for masonry. AS3700 covers a lot of the uh, construction requirements as well as some of the structural requirements um, that you need for your building. It includes a lot of the equations as to how much load your building can take. Another standard I really like um, is AS4773, masonry for small buildings. If you're not uh, good at maths like me, I don't like maths very much, um, AS 4773 is a great standard to look at because what it does is it takes all those equations from AS 3700, it calculates it for you and puts it in a nice, easy to read uh, table for you. So easily digestible, um, smaller condensed version of AS 3700. And lastly, we have AS 4455, um, which kind of covers the manufacturing guidelines for your masonry units, how strong they have to be, um, and some of the dimensional deviations that you can have. Um, so moving on, 
where can masonry be used? Uh, the answer is, well, just about anywhere, right? Whether you're building a small family house in the suburbs, or if you're building a uh, multi-story uh, commercial building in the city, masonry is applicable just about anywhere. When you're looking into what type of masonry unit uh, you might choose to use for your project, you have really a lot of different options. The great thing about masonry and the great thing about um, bricks and blocks is that they're simple yet incredibly versatile, right? Here are some of the main masonry units that you might come across. The first one being cord units um, that we see on the top right. And this is basically a brick um, with holes in it. And this is probably the most common brick that you'd come across. Some other units you might see would be your solid units and your horizontally cored units. And all of the manufacturers would uh, manufacture these units to high quality. Um, so you can be uh, confident that these will last you a very long time. There are also different dimensions for bricks and blocks, right? So focusing on clay masonry today, your traditional brick size is uh, 230 by 110 by 76. This is the standard size in Australia. Uh, but don't be afraid. There are also a lot of different other sizes that you can get uh, on the market. For example, uh, a particular size that is coming uh, becoming more and more popular recently is the longer, uh, thinner profile uh, brick units that we see in more contemporary and modern projects. Um, when an architect wants to emphasize perhaps a more sleeker, a more modern look, they might choose to use a longer brick. And a lot of our members uh, produce bricks and blocks of all different shapes and sizes. In addition to your sizes, you can also have different finishes um, for different applications for different purposes. And also different textures, right? And this goes back again to how you want your building to look, how you want your project to look. If you want a more modern building, you might choose to use the ultra smooth texture. Or if you want a more rustic, a more heritage, a more you know, old, worn down look uh, to give it a little bit more character, you might go for the tumbled texture, right? Really a lot of different options. And lastly, colors. Um, I heard somewhere that bricks come in over 300 different colors, which is just mind boggling to think about, right? So at the end of the day, when you're considering using brick, when you consider the amount of customization that you can do at such a small scale, it really gives you unlimited um, limitless potential as a designer, right? To showcase that, um, I want to show you a project that uh, was done by G JBG Architects, the Barsosa Valley Chocolate Company. And you can see that the brick color ranges that were selected really highlights the function of the building, which is really to create yummy chocolate, right? Chocolatey goodness. And you can see that in the colors and the patterns. Also different shapes uh, to, create, to create different textures, um, or if you wanna finish your corners in different ways. And here's another project that I wanna highlight, showcasing the creative use of different brick shapes and sizes, right? In this example, they use the bullnose brick where the corners of the bricks are rounded. And by laying your bullnose bricks, the architects that form and function building design was able to create this unique texture to the building. Uh, one thing I really like about this building is actually um, the lowered window that we see right there. Uh, this is a childcare center. 
So by having that low in the window, those little kids could look out. And I just think that's really cute. When designing masonry, there are also a bunch of different wall types that you can use. Some common ones that we see, especially in residential construction, include brick veneer, right? And this is when you have your structural frame followed by an external brick facade, right? So your inner frame, it could be steel studs or it could be timber studs. That would be your load bearing structure. What you would then do is apply that outer leaf, that outer skin of brick for those extra durability and thermal benefits that come with brick. Some other common walling systems include cavity brick, where you have two layers of brick, two skins of brick, as well as reverse brick veneer, where you have your structural frame on the outside and your solid uh, brickwork. All with different applications and uh, different uses and different pros and cons. Right. And here are just some different applications that we see and some really great uh, projects um, that have been previously submitted into the Think Brick Awards from Jesse Bennett and from Studio Bright. And lastly, we have some diagrams uh, further uh, showcasing the point here about different wall types. Here we have your brick veneer. And we can see the internal stud frame with the outer brick wall. And here's another diagram of cavity brick, where you have two leaves of brick. And now I might pass to Jack to talk about some of the masonry benefits. Easy. Thanks, Jim. Um, so. When we talk about masonry benefits, there's obviously a few that are quite obvious and inherent within the actual clay brick products themselves. Um, but there's a couple more that you know we need to have a bit of a deep dive into and consider as well when we're looking at designing and constructing in brick. Um, so I personally like to think of it as the four S's uh, where we have strength, savings, sustainability, and style. Um, and it's worth considering all four of these benefits elements uh, separately and bringing them all together um, to actually show what you might get out of a masonry house or a masonry building. Um, and once again, you can see here um, some great projects that have been previously submitted into the Think Brick Awards. Um, and they demonstrate different masonry techniques as well. In particular, um, Tiger Prawn down in the bottom right there uses some great curves um, to you know, accentuate the building structure. So in terms of strength, we can look at these eight core foundation principles. So bricks are obviously weather resistant, um, and this is going to you know, come down to your uh, moisture, rain, hail, and wind. So obviously with great quality design and construction, your brick walls are going to be able to prevent moisture ingress um, and prevent damage from wind and hail. Um, which also brings us to the fact that masonry units are actually bump resistant as well. Um, and this means that they have a high abrasion resistance. So too often with some modern building materials, it's quite easy to, you know, run past them or I don't know, if you have kids uh, playing outside, throwing balls or anything like that, the minute it hits the wall, uh, it can leave a nasty, nasty mark or a nasty dent. But you'll find that with bricks, uh, particularly, you know, your clay and concrete brick products, um, that this is unlikely to happen, which you know gives them increased durability. Um, further on top of that, obviously bricks are termite resistant. Um, I don't know how many people here have owned a house or lived in a house made of wood. I know that as a child, I grew up in a house made out of wood and spent two years with my family uh, trying to rebuild it from termite damage. Um, so that's one thing that you can avoid using clay bricks. Again, Masonry has great acoustic uh, properties, which makes them sound resistant. And this is due to the high density of bricks. So obviously this is great for building, you know, party walls. Um, and in Australia, we're currently seeing an increase in building density um, and multi-dwelling apartments. 
So this is of particular benefit for building designers and architects to consider uh, when they're building these multi-dwelling apartments. Um, but from an engineering standpoint, um, and what we like to look at, particularly in the technical team here at ThinkBrick, is the idea of versatility in strength uh, for masonry. So obviously, as Jim alluded to earlier, there's a number of different walling systems um, that can be employed with clay bricks. You know, your cavity brick, your brick veneer, and even your solid uh, single skin and double skin walls. Um, but what's more important is that bricks are strong in compression. However, there is the ability to reinforce them uh, with either a structural frame or even reinforcement mesh within the bricks themselves, which allows architects and engineers to work closely together to come up with some really interesting and innovative solutions to build more complex structures um, that would otherwise be you know, impossible to do with other building materials or more difficult. But most importantly, um, one thing that bricks have in terms of over other materials is they're incredibly fire resistant. Uh, so when bricks are made and manufactured, they're actually fired in a kiln at over 1000 degrees. Um, and they're made of natural clays and shales, which means that they are a non-combustible material. And this is why you'll often see clay brick houses still standing and concrete brick houses still standing, um, even after bushfires have re devastated an area. Um, and this is particularly poignant considering the bushfires that have just ravaged the country um, recently. So in terms of bushfire construction, um, bricks might be your number one go-to. So moving on to savings um, as another masonry benefit, obviously bricks are mass produced. Uh, any material that is able to be mass produced is usually uh, a little bit cheaper to obtain, uh, cheaper to transport and easier to get to your building site which all leads to reduced costs. Um, furthermore, the fact that they are so durable means that bricks are low maintenance and don't require replacement as often as other materials will. Um, and this alludes to that seventh point on the right there. Bricks have a long lifespan. And as Jim mentioned before, they're manufactured to a very high standard and quality checked at the manufacturing plant um, at our members facilities and factories. So you can be assured that using bricks, you're going to get a quality product that is going to last the test of time. Um, and you know, this goes back to the fact that houses with bricks will have excellent resale value just because bricks will last longer and um, create quality construction. And you know, you can see an example of this um, with the house down the bottom there. This is 50-50 um, designed by Architecture Architecture. Uh, I think they were a fan of double words. Um, but you can see they used recycled bricks here um, for their project, uh, which led them to increased savings for their client. And this was an entrant in the Think Brick Awards. So now we come to sustainability, which is one of the more important points to consider, you know, moving forward with innovative and future architectural design. Um, so bricks have low embodied carbon. Um, and what this actually means is that during the manufacturing process and the resource extraction process and the delivery process, bricks actually use less energy um, from start to finish in that manufacturing and transport process. And this means that they're actually more environmentally friendly from a life cycle point of view um, than other materials such as aluminium and surprisingly, even most timber products. Um, so when considering the life cycle analysis for your building and how it might perform from a sustainability point of view, it's definitely worth considering this fact. Um, but more importantly, even as bricks come towards the end of their lifetime, they are recyclable in so many different ways. Um, so you can see an excellent example of this down on the bottom left with the Waterloo House from Anthony Gill Architects. Um, so to create this screen that you see on the slides, they actually use recycled bricks um, from other projects. But even if you're not able to use bricks um, for construction, you can actually break them down and use them as aggregate in other products. Um, so testing from 2008 actually found that concrete could be manufactured using crushed bricks and could have similar strength characteristics to using other aggregates. Um, but further on top of that, bricks have a high thermal mass, which means that they can actually store heat energy um, and release that slowly over a longer period of time, which actually means that you will reduce costs on having to space condition your house. So the example that I like to think about 
is a hot day. Um, so bricks will actually absorb the hot solar energy during the peak temperatures of the day and will actually store that within the brick itself. And then as it gets cooler, the brick will slowly release that heat. Um, and this is known as thermal lag. And this will actually keep the interior of your building at a more comfortable temperature for a longer time. But finally, moving on to one of the more fun benefits of masonry, um, style. As Jim mentioned earlier, there's a number of different masonry units, sizes, colors, shapes, um, and the engineering versatility of bricks means that they can be used in limitless applications to make any project you might envision. Um, and all you need to do is actually have a look at these two projects underneath um, Henley Clays from Ben and Penner Architecture using barrel bricks there. It looks stunning um, and it's a great interior space uh, to be in. And then there, even on the right-hand side, you can see Hancock House from Cavalleris Urban Design, um, which entered into our Think Brick Awards uh, six years ago. And it still looks great. It still looks like a brand new uh, project. So this now brings us to the part of the webinar where we ask ourselves, you know, what can we actually do with bricks? We've seen how they look, we've seen what shapes, colors, and sizes, um, but what can we actually have a look at with bricks? And I, I noticed Jim has actually just put a poll up there. Um, I, if everyone can have a bit of a look at that. Um, what is most important to you as a designer in terms of the benefits that we've just discussed? Um, I know that for most of you, all of those benefits will be important, um, but it's interesting to see, you know, what people prioritize. Um, yep, so I've got a bit of a favor for strength and durability, style. It's good to see a bit of a mixture of answers out there. Um, but you can see here on this slide, uh, these are going to be the six architectural masonry techniques that we're going to cover today. Uh, we're not going to cover them in great detail, um, just because that will be saved for future episodes of the webinar. Um, but we'd like to give everyone here a bit of a taste as to, you know, what is possible with clay bricks. Um, and obviously these techniques can be applied with your concrete blocks as well, mind you. So starting with hit and miss walls, um, the idea of these is to offset the stacking pattern of the bricks to create gaps in the brickwork. Um, so what this allows for is it allows for light to actually permeate through the screen as well as air, and it can create a sort of really nice visual look, uh, particularly if a window is placed behind the screen, can give a really playful uh, sort of design with respect to light entering a space. Um, and you might have seen before, even with the Waterloo House um, from Anthony Gill Architects, you can even use hit and miss walls um, as a sort of plant screen and actually put uh, vegetation behind them to, you know, enhance the look and colour of your house. So three examples here that we can see. Um, on the far left, you know, you've got a pattern with consistent bedding and spacing to create a really nice even look, um, which has been used in the Rose House by Bracar Moroni Architecture. Um, a little bit more playful and a bit more fun, we've actually got a pattern where the architects have actually turned some of the bricks to create a sort of random uh, hit and miss screen. Uh, and so what they've done is they've actually turned the bricks to expose both the stretcher and the header face um, to create different shapes to play around with. And this is the um, six on six apartments by Tridente. And lastly, you can actually see uh, creating a pattern by turning or using different sized bricks. Um, so this is Aperture House by Cox Rayner, and they actually turned the bricks similarly to Tridente and exposed that header face. And you can see that they've actually left small gaps, even with the perp and mortar joints there, um, to create even more visual interest. So next we come to textured walls. So obviously bricks are quite rough. Um, that is their sort of characteristic being made of natural materials. However, we can take it one step further and we can add even more texture to our brick walls. Um, and you know, this can allow for a more tactile connection between the user and the building. Um, so for example, you can see on the far left, uh, we've got the Little Brick Studio from Make Architecture. 
and they've actually turned the brick sideways to expose their header face. Um, and this can allow for a really nice even texture to permeate through the actual brickwork itself. Um, more fun, in my opinion, is this middle project, which is the University of Queensland Micro Health Lab. So M3 Architecture, they actually uh, had a bit of a play around with a sledgehammer for this project, and they actually started smashing bricks in their design studio to see what sort of effect that created um, for their project. And you can see the final result here. They've actually turned the rough cut cord bricks on their side um, to create even more roughness in the building itself. Um, and that actually, that building was meant to look like a giant brick itself. So by doing that, they actually achieved that really natural rough look in their brickwork. Finally, we get to the YTH residence, which is creating texture by twisting the bricks on their head. Um, so you can see here, this is an exterior brick wall where the architects have actually twisted the bricks and st stood them up to create an almost sort of sawtooth look. So going on to stack bonding now. So stack bonding is where we actually take the masonry units themselves and we lay them directly on top of one another to really emphasize both the verticality and horizontality of a wall. Um, so you can actually do this with different size bricks and different shaped bricks to create unique patterns. Um, so this can start from something that we see on the left here. Um, this project is the Gibson's Bay, Gordon's Bay House, sorry, or GB House um, by Renato de Tor Architects. And what they actually done, uh, what they actually did in this project is they actually turned the bricks on their side to expose the cores um, and create a sort of screen effect and a stack bonded brick effect. So they've actually combined two different architectural masonry techniques there um, to create quite a stunning interior and exterior space. Next to that, you've got um, using stack bonding again with exposing the header faces. And, you know, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, this is actually a primary school which uses custom bricks stack bonded to create a really unique effect. So it's not only a stack bonded wall, um, but it's also textured by using those splayed bricks. So really, you can do a lot of different things uh, with stack bonded walls. And, you know, you can actually even put reinforcement mesh from an engineering standpoint uh, to make these walls even stronger. So then we come to another really fun one, curved walls. Um, so who said masonry walls have to be a rectangle? Am I right? So bricks can be stacked in such a way um, to actually replicate a curve. Now, this is usually seen with different materials, but more recently, curved walls are becoming um, really popular from architects and building designers um, to create a very interesting visual effect with their buildings. Um, and so obviously this can be done by laying the bricks in a number of ways and, you know, manipulating the joints between the bricks to give that curve effect. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see here the cooperage um, from Jackson Teese and Damien Barker. They've actually continued to lay the bricks um, in a regular stretcher bonded fashion, um, but they've just slowly formed a gradual curve there um, by manipulating the mortar joints between the bricks. Um, and you can see in the second photo here, uh, this is the BCC Mercy Campus from Coda Studio. And they've actually offset each course of bricks to create a curve. And they've actually, in doing so, created texture within the wall as well as a curve. Um, so, you know, you can combine all of these techniques together to create something quite visually stunning. And finally, if you're going for a tighter curve, um, you can actually turn the bricks on their side or on their face to expose the header or sailor face, or even in this case, the stretcher face. Um, and this will allow you to actually make tighter curves as well. Uh, I do know that some projects as well do achieve curved walls by using um, custom bricks um, or different shaped bricks. So again, we've got brick arches as well. Um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the brick arch. 
it's been around since uh, the second millennium BC, so you know, just before we arrived. <laughs> um, but obviously bricks have the ability to, or arches rather, have the ability to redirect vertical loads laterally into the supporting arch supports. Um, we now have the technology and engineering expertise to actually manipulate arches a little bit more um, and create some more visually interesting arches. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side, we have uh, Koichi Takata Architects Project Arc. Uh, it's quite infamous in Sydney, and they've actually used the simple arch design and replicated it on itself uh, to create a sort of 3D arch effect with having multiple arches stacked on top of one another. Um, and you can see here with the second middle project, you can actually create a more circular arch by continuing to um, shape the bricks past the horizontal lines. Uh, and this is the double courtyard house by Owen Vokes and Peters. But perhaps more interesting from an engineering standpoint um, for any engineers in the chat today is actually using steel to help you manipulate brickwork. Um, so you can see here, this is the Australian Ballet School by MGS Architects, and they actually wanted to create an arch, but continue to have stretch bound brickwork throughout the facade. So they've actually used the arch to support the brickwork or used the steel arch lintel, I should say, to support the brickwork, which gives the illusion of creating a brick arch. Um, so what I would suggest here to everyone watching today is, you know, don't be afraid to have a bit of a play around with combining materials uh, because you can create some very interesting designs and very unique designs by playing around with, you know, steel and bricks. And finally, we come to brick landscaping. So uh, we shouldn't forget our landscape designers here, but you can have a lot of fun with using bricks outdoors. It's not just a material to build houses and apartments and commercial buildings out of. Um, so you can obviously use bricks to create garden beds and really, really nice outdoor spaces. And this is on the far left-hand side, you can see uh, the Arcadia Apartments designed by three companies, DKO, Breathe and Oculus. Um, and I believe this actually won the Landscape Award during last year's Think Brick Awards. Um, but even then, you know, you can use bricks for roadways. Uh, so this is the Victor Harbour Main Street precinct. And you can actually, you know, lay brick pavers themselves and create some really nice roadways and pedestrian footpaths. And even then, brick, bricks can be used for furniture and appliances. Uh, so this is actually a brick fireplace that's been used, that's been constructed um, at the Brook at Byford. And it's actually a series of uh, barbecues that have actually been constructed to look like an actual chimney or a fireplace. So, you know, don't be afraid to manipulate the brickwork to, you know, build your own furniture even. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think Jim's going to put a poll out there. These are some of the uh, architectural masonry techniques that we want to sort of look at in more detail over the next few episodes. Uh, so we're curious to see, you know, specifically what techniques you might be more interested in hearing about, uh, because we'll go into looking at some actual case studies and showing how the architects and engineers actually went from the design all the way through to the actual finished product. So yeah, we can see Hit and Miss Walls, very popular. Um, very, 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 very fun architectural masonry technique. <laughs> um, keep in mind, we'll probably cover all of these techniques over the next few episodes, um, but this will just give us a bit of an idea of you know, where to go moving forward. But I think I'll palm off to Jim now and he will take us through a case study um, for everyone to have a bit of a look at to get an idea as to what to expect in future episodes. Thanks, Jack. Um, I see there's no love for brick arches, which is a bit sad to see, but a lot of hit and miss and a lot of curb walls, which I also like. Um, so right now I'm going to take you through a case study on how the famous Dr. Chow Chak Wing building at the University of Technology, Sydney, was built. 
Um, this is a really great project that really highlights the capacity of Brick and how creative uh, you can be with Brick. Uh, this building has been uh, described as anything from a crumpled paper bag, uh, a tree house, and some people say it's a masterpiece as well. So it's a really interesting project, uh, definitely, and that's why we're going through it today. So firstly, I want to show you uh, the initial concept for the Chow Chak Wing building. And the concept sketch that you see here is uh, quite typical and recognizable as uh, a Gary sketch, right? A sketch by Frank Gary. That is so in his style um, and so crazy. And initially, a lot of people didn't think that this building was going to be built out of brick. But to see this concept become this um, is really quite fascinating. And a lot of that is due to collaboration between architects and engineers, but also a lot of innovation as well from the manufacturers, right? From the brick manufacturers. So here's another concept model that was uh, initially uh, proposed in the initial stages of design. And it really highlights uh, the lighting aspect of it as well. When the sun moves around through the day, the building will look, would look different, um, whether it's in the morning or if it's in the evening. So that's a really cool part of it as well. So the $180 million question, how are we going to build this out of brick? Right. There's a lot of structural considerations to consider, a lot of construction considerations to consider, right? as well as how on earth we were going to make uh, this facade uh, stand by itself from a material that we would usually think is rectilinear. Right? How are we going to make uh, these curves, these organic shapes from rectangular bricks? And a big part of achieving the project was the collaboration, right? The collaboration not only between the architects and the engineers, but also the bricklayers at Favetti Bricklaying, which often gets overlooked. Um, often, we, often we see architects and engineers working together, and obviously that's always good to see, um, but the construction people sometimes get left out. So we want to emphasize working with your bricklayers. So to achieve this project, initially four options were considered, four construction solutions were considered. The first option was to use a brick tile, right? So that have a, the structure itself, it could be concrete or it could be steel. And they were thinking of adding a tile to make it look like it was made of brick, but it wasn't actually brick, right? The second option was to use precast panels with brick inlays. So this could be uh, pre-made concrete structures with bricks inlaid into the concrete. The third option uh, was to not use brick at all, using a folded metal facade. And the fourth option was to use essentially a brick veneer, right? So a structural frame with a brick facade that is not load bearing. So I'm just curious, uh, what do you think was the option that was eventually chosen? Or what do you think was the best option uh, for making this Chow Chak building a reality? And I think there's a poll that's been put up. Mm -hmm. A lot of you going with brick and veneer with a precast structure.
In truth, they're all great options. And when building with masonry, they're all options that you can definitely explore, right? For this particular case, a brick veneer was chosen. So most of you were right. Um, what they did was essentially they had a steel structural frame and they tied the brick facade to the frame, right? Another thing that was considered in the initial stages of the project was what brick to use, right? And initially they actually considered using a, an American brick, which is different from your standard Australian brick, right? So initially they considered importing those bricks to Australia. But the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, were adamant on using locally manufactured bricks. So then the testing trials began, right? They worked with the manufacturers to create a lot of different prototypes of bricks. And they actually worked with um, the barrel uh, brick plant south of Sydney to manufacture a bunch of different shapes um, that they initially considered, right? some really long brick shapes um, with different unique core sizes, different cant shapes, um, just to explore how exactly they were gonna make that facade come to life. After a bunch of different trials uh, with different extrusions, uh, different solid bricks, dry press bricks, uh, different widths, cores, patterns, they eventually, uh, they eventually agreed on five uh, completed shapes that they were going to use on the project. And I'm going to go through those shapes in just a second. But before they could start constructing, they also had to collaborate with the bricklayers at Favetti Bricklaying and to see exactly how much they can push the limits of brick construction. All right, so here's a test panel that we see uh, that was done by the Favetti bricklayers, testing the cobbling and the curvature limitations, right? How much your brick can overhang whilst it is still, first of all, structurally stable. So when you're laying the bricks, they don't fall over during construction. And also how much the bricks can overhang um, from a workmanship uh, perspective. What they found out from these tests was that traditional brick ties could not be used, right? Your traditional brick ties your, uh, that you tie in for your residential homes, they did not give the adequate structural support. And here are some more test panels, uh, again, testing how tight the curves can be realistically and still look good from a workmanship perspective. Because they found out the traditional brick ties could not be used, what they actually did was create a custom brick ties. The engineers at ACOM um, working in conjunction with uh, the manufacturers at Brickworks and Barrel. And this custom brick tie was essentially um, threading a piece of metal through the brick wall itself and tying that piece of threaded uh, steel rod back to the structural frame. And how this would work was they'd elongate the frog that was typically in a brick. So sometimes for solid bricks, you would see a frog, which is that uh, rebate that we see there. For this project, for the Chow Chak building, what they actually did was extend that rebate so that they could uh, thread a piece of steel rod through it and link the entire facade together, right? And we see the custom bricks that were made at the barrel plant here. We also see an L-shaped brick that was produced by barrel. 
And the purpose of this L-shaped brick is to hide the shelf angles at each floor of the building, right? So at each floor, they'd have a shelf angle to support each uh, story of brick. But obviously, they want the facade to look continuous. They don't want each floor to look separated from the outside. And that's why they created this special L-shaped brick to hide some of the structural components um, of the building itself. And lastly, they also have the uh, K brick, which is another special shape that was made for this project. And this was used to create more interesting uh, textures and cobbling in the brick facade. And of course, the standard 230, 110 by 76 high brick, the classic um, that can be used anywhere. When they were manufacturing the bricks, um, again, they were manufactured at barrel and brick manufacturers, uh, a lot of the brick, brick manufacturing process is actually automated, but because of these unique shapes that were created, a lot of the bricks actually had to be manually stacked. So a lot of collaboration, again, between the engineers, the architects, as well as the manufacturers all of them working together, trying to achieve the same vision that Gary Architects had. And here were the final uh, custom four shapes, the custom four brick shapes that were created for the project. And here's the custom brick tie system uh, showcased, right? So again, the steel rod, tying the entire facade together, providing that structural support, as well as having the washers that you might see if you look closely, the washers pinching the brick together um, where it is tied to the, to the brick tie, right? And this pinching, those washers, that actually helps with the construction process, right? So when they're laying the cobbled bricks, as you might imagine, for very uh, excessive cobbled sections, the brick would tend to fall over if you don't let the mortar harden first, right? By allowing this custom brick uh, tie system to pinch the bricks like that, what they can do is construct the bricks, lay the mortar, and construct the next level without having to wait for the mortar to dry first. And here again, we see that brick tie system in action, right? Tying the entire facade together. Again, a lot of test panels were made for this project. A lot of prototypes were made. And here's an example of a test panel um, constructed not only to test the structural aspect of the building, but also to test the weatherproofing requirements of the building to test uh, the durability and to test how applicable it was uh, in terms of long lasting, in terms of brick cleaning, in terms of uh, how long it can maintain that good look. And a lot of these prototypes were actually uh, constructed in China. And here we see an example of the shelf angle that I mentioned earlier. So at each floor, they would have these uh, steel platforms to hold up each story of brick facade, right? And because they didn't want to show that steel detailing in the facade, they wanted to make the facade look continuous. What they did was use the L-shaped bricks to help hide uh, some of the steel detailing behind the structure. And again, here we see the custom brick ties in action, right? Tying the brick facade back to the frame. And the K bricks in action as well, creating that unique texture to the building and adding that little bit extra visual interest 
right? Because of how uh, custom and how unique and how organic the brick facade actually was. Uh, yes, Andres, uh, we will share this PowerPoint uh, to registrants, to people who have attended the presentation. So you'll be able to look at each of these slides in detail. Um, but because of how custom and how unique uh, the shape of the building was, each of the steel fabrications, each of the steel frame structures actually had unique numbers uh, to help with the construction of the building, right? So each piece was definitely unique. And here we see a unique image of the building uh, during construction. And we see the steel structural frame uh, before all the brick walls were placed in. These steel frames were made from galvanized steel uh, to help with the durability and to make sure that this uh, frame was strong enough to withstand not only the weight and the loads of the building itself, but also to hold the weight of the brick facade as well. Right, so a lot of really technical uh, engineering being done in this building. And again, we see the brick tie system uh, being placed, ready to tie the brick facade back. And some more of the shelf angles um, that are used to help support the bricks on each floor, right? So a lot of innovations, a lot of different ways to create the end product, which is what we see today at UTS, right? And to see this uh, pushing of the limits of the brick material by Frank Gehry and to really push um, what we normally consider is a rectilinear uh, material to make it look like a fabric, to make it look organic, and to create all these different textures is really an uh, astonishing achievement by the architects, engineers, and the manufacturers, right? And again, some more photos showcasing the Chow Chow Queen building. And in typical Frank Gehry fashion, we see the craziness behind his designs, um, combining the more traditional material of brickwork and combining that with the metal and the glass facade on the very left. So combining two very different and distinct facades and making it come together, All right? And that brings us to the end of the case study. Um, what we also have on our website, if you're curious on maybe how to create different projects, if you're interested in how to construct, maybe you're looking after some detailing of some buildings, um, we have a bunch of manuals available free of charge on our website. Isn't that right, Jack? Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Jim. And um, yeah, I would recommend definitely checking out all the resources. Um, I've also just chucked a poll in the chat um, asking if anyone uh, in today's audience has visited the Chow Chow Wing building. Um, I know that I, I can see a, a mix of answers, sort of, you know, 30% yes, 60%, 70% no. Um, and I know that anyone that's not from Sydney, uh, this is probably the last place you want to visit. Um, but it's definitely well worth checking out if you ever do find yourself in Sydney. It's uh, certainly quite striking um, to drive past or, you know, walk past and, you know, even go inside if you get the opportunity. Um, yeah, definitely. I think seeing it in person um, also gives a sense of just how sculptural and how, how big it actually is. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so yeah, just moving. So yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, and moving on to just, you know, housekeeping and finalizing um, the rest of the presentation. I just want to remind everyone that we have a very large socials presence, particularly on, you know, Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. So I would definitely recommend uh, everyone have a look at our Instagram in particular to see those top 40 projects um, and to have a bit of a look at, you know, seeing where masonry design is going um, now and moving into the future. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for coming and keep a lookout um, for our episode two. So we're going to be running these webinars um, every second month, every alternating month uh, on the last Wednesday of each month. So episode two will be launching on Wednesday, the 25th of August. Um, and based on the poll results today for what topics you would all like to see, um, I think we might do a bit of a deep dive into some hit and miss walls um, and have a little bit of a look at some case studies there. Uh, but just before we go, if anyone does have any case studies they'd like us to look at in detail um, and they'd like us to actually do a bit of research on and bring to the next episode, please feel free to message those into the chat. Um, and Jim and myself and the rest of the technical team here at ThinkBrick will do our best to, you know, drum up a bit of interesting research for it um, and show uh, all of you how the building projects actually came together. Um, so yeah, feel free to drop those in in the chat. Otherwise, we have a couple that we will probably go through for you um, and show you, you know, how these designs came forward from concept to construction um, all the way up to finished project. And uh, do remember that, you know, if there's anything you need help with technically in the future, any questions you might have on how a design might come together or, you know, what you might be able to do with bricks, uh, feel free to email us um, at ThinkBrick and we will definitely have a bit of a look at it for you and get back to you with the answer. Um, so with all that being said, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, and thank you for having a bit of a listen and interacting with the presentation and learning a little bit more about architecture and how masonry can be used uh, in combination with architectural design. So we um, hope to see you all in episode two. Um, I'm sure in the future there'll be an email um, circulating around. Um, and as Jim said, these slides will be circulated to all of you um, in case you want to refer back to these. Um, so yeah, uh, anything else you want to add, Jim? No, uh, just thank you again um, for coming along and joining this very first episode. Um, yeah, we, we really want to make this uh, a webinar that suits your needs, um, that talks about things that you're interested in, um, problems that might come up in your projects, and just to, just to improve the general knowledge out there. So thank you for coming along. Yeah, so um, I hope all of you have a wonderful morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you are across the country. Um, and yeah, we hope to see all of you um, on Wednesday, August 25th for episode two. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I might leave the webinar open for maybe a minute or two if we have any questions. And then we might close, close off from there. Perfect. Bye. All right, thank you everybody. I think uh, no questions. So thanks again, bye.